Deuteronomy 2 verses 8 to 20, chapter 4, His accomplices, Genesis 6 verse 1, And it came to pass, when men began to multiply on the face of the earth, and daughters were born unto them. Because of Adam's sin a death sentence was passed down to everyone. Romans 6 verse 23 says, For the wages of sin is death. And Ezekiel 18 verse 20 says, The soul that sinneth, it shall die. Mankind was originally intended to live forever as was discussed earlier, but now sin had entered into the picture, and so death would now have its say in everyone's life. People were living for over 900 years, which presented a major problem after just a short time, if you can imagine. People were being born on a daily basis, but people were not dying as quickly to sustain a proper balance. God's word says it best when it says, men began to multiply. If you spend about five minutes with a calculator trying to figure out how many people there may have been alive at the time of the flood, you can easily conceive of a number possibly in the billions. The sons of God, Genesis 6 verse 2, that the sons of God saw the daughters of men, that they were fair, and they took them wives of all which they chose. Here is another portion of scripture that has been the subject of many debates. Just who were the sons of God and the daughters of men? For the answer, we must let the Bible interpret itself. What I mean by that is that too many cults have latched onto a verse or portion of scripture as the Mormons have done with this verse, and have tried to make it say something that the Bible in other places says something to the contrary. First of all, let me say that God is not the author of confusion. Satan is. Satan is the one that wants the scriptures to be misapplied and misunderstood. Let us deal with the part of the verse that talks about the daughters of men first. For this we do not need to do any spiritualizing at all. They are what they say they are, the daughters of men, period. Nothing in scripture points to any other conclusion. Their thoughts and actions were evil continually as the scriptures point out but they were normal human beings, just like Eve was. The problem arises when people begin to guess and to give their individual theories to others instead of seeing what the Bible has to say about who the sons of God were. Let me explode the most popular unsubstantiated myth floating around today regarding this subject first. Scripture does not teach that these sons of God were believers who simply married some heathen women and magically produced giant offspring. If that were so, then why don't we still see it occurring today? Many deceived people who are saved today marry people who are not saved. Yet we see normal children as a result of these forbidden unions. The sons of God were angels that had intercourse with human women and produced this type of offspring. Angels do not marry in heaven because they are all male, but these left their first habitation or estate. They cannot reproduce without human help. All the angels that were around then are still around now. No angel has ever been born or ever will be born. Scripture says nothing of any further angels being created other than the ones created initially. The term son of God or sons of God mean they are direct creations of God. Adam is the only man that is called a son of God in this sense, because he was a direct creation of God, making God his father. Adam had no earthly father, neither did the angels, which lets you know why they are often called sons of God because they are direction creations of God making him their father as well. Scripture does support the idea however, that fallen angels are capable of possessing lost individuals and inhabiting their bodies. The demoniac of Gadara for example, did not want Jesus to cast him out of a man unless he would allow him to go and possess the bodies of a herd of swine. Fallen angels crave to inhabit a warm body, preferably human. They understand that we are the crowning achievement of God's creation and the prime recipients of his love, and they want what they cannot have. So they take what is offered to them from men who give themselves over to a reprobate mind and possess them. They can never become human, but somehow this ungodly union produced a genetic nightmare and they all had to be destroyed by God in the flood initially and later by the nation of Israel in battle. The Mormons believe that these were God's children actually having physical intercourse with the daughters of men. God has only one son, begotten or otherwise. Jesus had no wife, he never has, and never will. He has never had nor will ever have physical intercourse with a woman. Mary was a virgin even after she was found with child. She relinquished her virginity with her husband Joseph, and he was the only one to ever know her in a physical way. Mormons have a different Jesus than that of the Bible just as the Christian evolutionist does. There are many false Christs gone out into the world. Genesis 6 verse 3, And the Lord said, My spirit shall not always strive with man, for that he also is flesh, 
yet his days shall be an hundred and twenty years. God will not continually strive with us in the flesh, because he has numbered our days for our own good. We were originally created to live forever, but sin entered into the picture in the garden. God limited our lifespan to around 1,000 years of age, because the wages of sin is death, Romans 6, verse 23. After the flood, God reduced that number much lower as an act of love down to 120 years, today it is 70 years. What evil one man could accomplish if he were to live a thousand years as in the days before the flood? For more on this subject, go back and reread chapter 3. Many believe that this statement in verse 3 is a time clock for judgment. That God was saying through Noah that the flood would come in exactly 120 years. Genesis 6 verse 4, there were giants in the earth in those days. And also, after that, when the sons of God came in unto the daughters of men, and they bare children to them, the same became mighty men which were of old, men of renown. Notice that verse 4 says that there were giants in the earth in those days, and also, after that, i.e., the flood. Goliath was a post-flood descendant of the sons of God, coming in unto the daughters of men. These would have had to have been another batch, if you will of these ungodly unions, because this first batch all died in the flood. Genesis 6 verses 5 to 8, And God saw that the wickedness of man was great in the earth, and that every imagination of the thoughts of his heart was only evil continually. And it repented the Lord that he had made man on the earth, and it grieved him at his heart. And the Lord said, I will destroy man whom I have created from the face of the earth, both man, and beast, and the creeping thing, and the fowls of the air, for it repenteth me that I have made them. But Noah found grace in the eyes of the Lord. If we think we have it tough today, we are wrong. Noah had it bad. Noah, in spite of all his circumstances, still did the right thing. God is looking for someone who will take a stand when everyone is taking the easy way out. He is looking for someone to speak out for him while the rest of Christianity remains silent. Genesis 6 verses 9 to 10 These are the generations of Noah. Noah was a just man and perfect in his generations, and Noah walked with God. And Noah begot three sons, Shem, Ham, and Japheth. The Jews were the descendants of Shem while those living on the African continent were descendants of Ham and the Europeans were the descendants of Japheth. Notice the statement that God said about Noah, that he was perfect in his generations. He did not say in his generation, which makes a big difference. What God was saying was that Noah's generations were not infected by the inbreeding of these sons of God with the daughters of men. The rest of the world however had been, and they all had to be destroyed to protect the future generations. Genesis 6 verses 11 to 13, the earth also was corrupt before God, and the earth was filled with violence. And God looked upon the earth, and behold, it was corrupt, for all flesh had corrupted his way upon the earth. And God said unto Noah, The end of all flesh is come before me, for the earth is filled with violence through them, and behold, I will destroy them with the earth. God was very gracious to Noah and his family by saving his family from the flood that was about to come as a judgment upon the earth. God had given man 120 years to repent under the preaching of Noah, but they kept on intermingling with these fallen angels, the sons of God, until only Noah's family remained untouched by them. Once they were destroyed in the flood, hell received its biggest one-day addition it has ever seen, or ever will see. Millions were added to its roles on that day, possibly even billions. A special place however was prepared for those sons of God which left their first estate and intermingled with the daughters of men according to the book of Jude. Jude 1 verse 6, And the angels which kept not their first estate, but left their own habitation, he hath reserved in everlasting chains under darkness unto the judgment of the great day. The book of Job also says that Satan and the sons of God have to give regular reports to God of their actions on the earth. Remember that sons of God can be both good and evil angels. Job 1 verses 6 to 7, Now there was a day when the sons of God came to present themselves before the Lord, and Satan came also among them. And the Lord said unto Satan, Whence comest thou? Then Satan answered the Lord, and said, From going to and fro in the earth, and from walking up and down in it. Notice Satan that was and is able to go to and fro in the earth, and that he can walk up and down in it. He is not in hell today. He is the God of this world and the prince of the power of the air. He is the accuser of the brethren according to Revelation chapter 12, that continually stands before God against us as our prosecutor throwing our sins before God. But thank God we have the best defense attorney that has fulfilled the law on our behalf. Revelation 12 verse 10, And I heard a loud voice saying in heaven, Now is come salvation, and strength, and the kingdom of our God, 
and the power of his Christ. For the accuser of our brethren is cast down, which accused them before our God day and night. Chapter 5 His Enemy Genesis 11 verses 1 to 4 And the whole earth was of one language, and of one speech. And it came to pass, as they journeyed from the east, that they found a plain in the land of Shinar, and they dwelt there. And they said one to another, Go to, let us make brick, and burn them throughly. And they had brick for stone, and slime had they for mortar. And they said, Go to, let us build us a city and a tower, whose top may reach unto heaven, and let us make us a name, lest we be scattered abroad upon the face of the whole earth. Here we see mankind deliberately disobeying God's command to fill the whole earth by choosing to stay in one place where God knew that Satan would use this to consolidate his control on man once. Again, the Gentiles were building a tower to the God of this world and they were following his course for it, which is mentioned often in Paul's writings. Ephesians 2 verse 2, wherein in time past ye walked according to the course of this world, according to the prince of the power of the air, the spirit that now worketh in the children of disobedience. Genesis 11 verses 5 to 6, And the Lord came down to see the city and the tower, which the children of men builded. And the Lord said, Behold, the people is one, and they have all one language, and this they begin to do, and now nothing will be restrained from them, which they have imagined to do. Through unity, you can accomplish almost anything. These people, however, were trying to accomplish their own will and not the Creator's. Today there is a big push amongst ecumenical circles to unite together and tear down denominational barriers that separate the body of Christ. God, however, establishes all kinds of barriers to divide truth from darkness, to protect us. We cannot yoke up with unbelievers or those who say that salvation is through our works or church membership. God forbids it. 2 Corinthians 6 verses 14 to 18, Be ye not unequally yoked together with unbelievers. For what fellowship hath righteousness with unrighteousness? And what communion hath light with darkness? And what concord hath Christ with Belial? Or what part hath he that believeth with an infidel? And what agreement hath the temple of God with idols? For ye are the temple of the living God. As God hath said, I will dwell in them, and walk in them, and I will be their God and they shall be my people. Wherefore come out from among them, and be ye separate, saith the Lord, and touch not the unclean thing. And I will receive you, and will be a father unto you, and ye shall be my sons and daughters, saith the Lord Almighty. He also has this to say to those who quote Psalm 1, 33 verse 1. Psalm 1, 33 verse 1, Behold, how good and how pleasant it is for brethren to dwell together in unity. Amos 3 verse 3, Can two walk together? except they be agreed? Unity is great, but not at the expense of truth. Isn't it amazing that the very same people who are saying doctrine divides are either the liberals or the tongues, babble, crowd? Genesis 11 verses 7 to 9, go to, let us go down, and there confound their language, that they may not understand one another's speech. So, the Lord scattered them abroad from thence upon the face of all the earth, and they left off to build the city. Therefore, is the name of it called Babel, because the Lord did there confound the language of all the earth, and from thence did the Lord scatter them abroad upon the face of all the earth. No explanation is needed here, you just accept God's word by faith. You do not try to explain away the miraculous, because in doing so, you rob your hearers of the glory of God in the situation. It was not long after the flood that God began to give up the Gentile nations to their uncleanness so that he might begin to re-establish his dominion on this earth through a unique nation that would bring forth the Messiah to redeem what Adam had lost. What seemed like a total loss for God in the giving up of all except Abram was really a brilliant move on God's part. Romans 1 verses 21 to 32, because that, when they knew God, they glorified him not as God, neither were thankful, but became vain in their imaginations and their foolish heart was darkened. Professing themselves to be wise, they became fools, and changed the glory of the uncorruptible God into an image made like to corruptible man, and to birds, and four-footed beasts, and creeping things. Wherefore, God also gave them up to uncleanness through the lusts of their own hearts, to dishonor their own bodies between themselves, who changed the truth of God into a lie, and worshipped and served the creature more than the Creator, who is blessed forever. Amen. For this cause God gave them up unto vile affections, for even their women did change the natural use into that which is against nature, and likewise, also the men, leaving the natural use of the woman, burned in their lust one toward another, men with men working that which is unseemly, and receiving in themselves that recompense of their error which was meet. And even as they did not like to retain God in their knowledge, God gave them over to a reprobate mind, to do those things which are not convenient, being filled with all unrighteousness, fornication, wickedness, covetousness, maliciousness, full of envy, murder, debate, deceit, malignity, 
whisperers, backbiters, haters of God, despiteful, proud, boasters, inventors of evil things, disobedient to parents, without understanding, covenant breakers, without natural affection, implacable, unmerciful, who knowing the judgment of God, that they which commit such things are worthy of death, not only do the same, but have pleasure in them that do them. Three times it is said that God gives up the Gentiles, or that he gives over the Gentile nations, to walk after their own desires. It is at this time that God once again starts over with just one person. This time it is Abram, who later becomes Abraham. Genesis 12 verses 1 to 3 Now the Lord had said unto Abram, Get thee out of thy country, and from thy kindred, and from thy father's house, unto a land that I will shew thee, and I will make of thee a great nation, and I will bless thee, and make thy name great, and thou shalt be a blessing, and I will bless them that bless thee, and curse him that curseth thee, and in thee shall all families of the earth be blessed. As God begins his plan of action to redeem the earth which has been kept secret from the foundation of the earth, he takes Abram and starts a nation from his loins that will give us the Messiah, who will redeem this earth from the curse. Satan now has to adapt to this move by God by any means necessary, and he does. He first starts by encouraging Abram to let his nephew Lot come along on his journey, which is a direct violation of God's command to him. Satan then secures an Egyptian handmaiden for Sarah while Abram is out of God's will in Egypt, whose name is Hagar, who later becomes Abram's wife and bears Ishmael. His descendants have not been friends to Israel throughout the ages. Satan tries while Jacob's descendants are all slaves in Egypt, to kill all the male children, to cut off the lineage of the Messiah, so he can never be born. Before Satan can destroy all the male children in Israel, God delivers Moses so he can deliver Israel. Once Israel is about to enter the land and the spies are sent in, we find out Satan's plan to try to thwart God's plan. He has already positioned in the land a group of his old friends that we will look at in the next chapter. Chapter 6. His Giants When Satan knew from the prophecy given to Abraham that the time was drawing near for the children of Israel to be freed from Egypt, he commanded some of his fellow sons of God to once again mingle with the daughters of men, just as they had done back in Genesis 6 before the flood. It is evident from this that Satan is extremely powerful and exercises that power ruthlessly over his minions, because we do not hear of any devils rebelling against his authority and refusing to follow his orders. Even though all of his previous giants were destroyed by God in a flood, that was an act of mercy to help save the human race. The devil had no problem commissioning a brand new group of angels for this task. The giants were not in Egypt, because that was not the land that Satan was concerned about. They were waiting fully grown in the land that Israel was now returning to as a nation, instead of just a family. Numbers 13, 17-33, And Moses sent them to spy out the land of Canaan, and said unto them, Get you up this way southward, and go up into the mountain and see the land, what it is, and the people that dwelleth therein, whether they be strong or weak, few or many, and what the land is that they dwell in, whether it be good or bad, and what cities they be that they dwell in, whether in tents, or in strongholds, and what the land is, whether it be fat or lean, whether there be wood therein, or not. And be ye of good courage, and bring of the fruit of the land. Now the time was the time of the first ripe grapes. So, they went up, and searched the land from the wilderness of Zin unto Rehob, as men come to Hamath. And they ascended by the south, and came unto Hebron, where Ahiman, Sheshai, and Talmai, the children of Anak, were. Now Hebron was built seven years before Zoan in Egypt. And they came unto the brook of Eshkol, and cut down from thence a branch with one cluster of grapes, and they bear it between two upon a staff, and they brought of the pomegranates, and of the figs. The place was called the brook Eshkol, because of the cluster of grapes which the children of Israel cut down from thence. And they returned from searching of the land after forty days. And they went and came to Moses, and to Aaron, and to all the congregation of the children of Israel, unto the wilderness of Paran, to Kadesh, and brought back word unto them, and unto all the congregation, and shewed them the fruit of the land. And they told him, and said, We came unto the land whither thou sentest us, and surely it floweth with milk and honey, and this is the fruit of it. Nevertheless, the people be strong that dwell in the land, and the cities are walled, and very great, and moreover, we saw the children of Anak there. The Amalekites dwell in the land of the south, and the Hittites, and the Jebusites, and the Amorites, dwell in the mountains, and the Canaanites dwell by the sea, and by the coast of Jordan. And Caleb stilled the people before Moses, and said, Let us go up at once, and possess it for we are well able to overcome it. But the men that went up with him said, We be not able to go up against the people, for they are stronger than we. And they brought up an evil report of the land which they had searched unto the children of Israel, 
saying, The land, through which we have gone to search it, is a land that eateth up the inhabitants thereof, and all the people that we saw in it are men of a great stature. And there we saw the giants, the sons of Anak, which come of the giants, and we were in our own sight as grasshoppers, and so we were in their sight. The Anakims were not the only giants that had dwelt in the land, there was also the Eames, the Horims, the Avims, and the Kaphtarims, but they were destroyed by God. These mostly as you will see lived in the land immediately after Lot and Abraham first came to it, and they were destroyed by God. This record is not found in Genesis, but it explains the rapid decline in the cities of Sodom and Gomorrah and God's destroying of them. Deuteronomy 2 verses 8 to 23, And when we passed by from our brethren the children of Esau, which dwelt in Seir, through the way of the plain from Elath, and from Eziangaber, we turned and passed by the way of the wilderness of Moab. And the Lord said unto me, Distress not the Moabites, neither contend with them in battle, for I will not give thee of their land for a possession, because I have given Ar unto the children of Lot for a possession. The Eames dwelt therein in times past, a people great, and many, and tall, as the Anakims, which also were accounted giants, as the Anakims, but the Moabites call them Eames. The Horims also dwelt in Seir before time, but the children of Esau succeeded them, when they had destroyed them from before them, and dwelt in their stead, as Israel did unto the land of his possession, which the Lord gave unto them. Now rise up, said I, and get you over the brook Zeard. And we went over the brook Zeard, and the space in which we came from Kadesh Barnea, until we were come over the brook Zeard, was thirty and eight years, until all the generation of the men of war were wasted out from among the host, as the Lord swear unto them. For indeed the hand of the Lord was against them, to destroy them from among the host, until they were consumed. So it came to pass, when all the men of war were consumed and dead from among the people, that the Lord spake unto me, saying, Thou art to pass over through Ar, the coast of Moab, this day. And when thou comest nigh over against the children of Ammon, distress them not, nor meddle with them, for I will not give thee of the land of the children of Ammon any possession, because I have given it unto the children of Lot for a possession. That also was accounted a land of giants, giants dwelt therein in old time, and the Ammonites call them Zamzamims, a people great, and many, and tall, as the Anakims. But the Lord destroyed them before them, and they succeeded them, and dwelt in their stead, as he did to the children of Esau, which dwelt in Seir, when he destroyed the Horms from before them. And they succeeded them, and dwelt in their stead even unto this day. And the Avams which dwelt in Hazram, even unto Azza, the Kaphtarims, which came forth out of Kaphtar, destroyed them, and dwelt in their stead. God tells Israel that he has already destroyed many of these giants in the past, and will do the same for them as they eventually will have to face the sons of Anak. Deuteronomy 3 verses 11 to 13, For only O.G. king of Bashan remained of the remnant of giants. Behold, his bedstead was a bedstead of iron, is it not in Rabbath of the children of Ammon? Nine cubits was the length thereof, and four cubits the breadth of it, after the cubit of a man. And this land, which we possessed at that time, from Aror, which is by the river Arnon, and half Mount Gilead, and the cities thereof, gave I unto the Reubenites, and to the Gadites, and the rest of Gilead, and all Bashan, being the kingdom of O.G., gave I unto the half-tribe of Manasseh, all the region of Argob, with all Bashan, which was called the land of giants. As you read of Israel's conquering of the land, you often hear the critics say, how could God be so cruel as to kill all those people, even the women and children? This is an honest question, but one that often goes unanswered when there is a perfectly logical answer given to us in the scriptures. God destroyed those in the flood because Satan had infected the whole human race with the exception of Noah's family for breeding the sons of God and the daughters of men, and he does the same thing. Here in destroying these descendants of the giants, before they can infect the children of Israel. Deuteronomy 9 verses 1 to 5 Here, O Israel, thou art to pass over Jordan this day, to go in to possess nations greater and mightier than thyself, cities great and fenced up to heaven, a people great and tall, the children of the Anakims, whom thou knowest, and of whom thou hast heard say, who can stand before the children of Anak. Understand therefore this day, that the Lord thy God is he which goeth over before thee. As a consuming fire, he shall destroy them, and he shall bring them down before thy face, so shalt thou drive them out, and destroy them quickly, as the Lord hath said unto thee, Speak not thou in thine heart, after that the Lord thy God hath cast them out from before thee, saying, For my righteousness, the Lord hath brought me in to possess this land. But for the wickedness of these nations, the Lord doth drive them out from before thee. Not for thy righteousness, or for the uprightness of thine heart, dost thou go to possess their land. But for the wickedness of these nations, the Lord thy God doth drive them out from before thee, 
and that he may perform the word which the Lord sware unto thy fathers, Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. God makes it clear that these descendants of the sons of God and daughters of men were being destroyed for the exceeding wickedness that they practiced far above anything that Israel had ever done. While the nation of Israel were slaves in Egypt, her daughters did not have the opportunity to mingle with these sons of God, which helped to maintain the purity of the Jewish race, thus enabling the lineage of the Messiah to stay untainted with this wicked seed. Joshua was obedient in going after these descendants of the giants all of his days. Joshua 11 verses 21 to 22, And at that time came Joshua, and cut off the Anakims from the mountains, from Hebron, from Debir, from Anab, and from all the mountains of Judah, and from all the mountains of Israel. Joshua destroyed them utterly with their cities. There was none of the Anakims left in the land of the children of Israel, only in Gaza, in Gath, and in Ashdod, there remained. Caleb also as an old man knew God would give him a great victory against them, not because Caleb was anything, but because God wanted them destroyed. He just wanted a man of faith to do it. Joshua 14 verse 12, Now therefore give me this mountain, whereof the Lord spake in that day. For thou heardest in that day how the Anakims were there, and that the cities were great and fenced, if so, be the Lord will be with me, then I shall be able to drive them out, as the Lord said. Joshua 14 verse 15, And the name of Hebron before was Kirjatharba, which Arba was a great man among the Anakims, and the land had rest from war. We learn from Joshua that the giants descended from Arba, who was Anak's father. Hebron used to be called Kirjatharba, as it was named after its most famous resident. Joshua 15 verse 13, And unto Caleb the son of Jephunneh, he gave a part among the children of Judah, according to the commandment of the Lord to Joshua, even the city of Arba, the father of Anak, which city is Hebron. Hundreds of years had passed, and yet the giants that had remained in Gaza, Gath, and Ashdod had continued and were a thorn continually in the sight of Israel throughout the period of the judges, as they would align themselves with the Philistines to fight with Israel. David and his servants destroyed Goliath and his seed. 2 Samuel 21 verse 16 And Ishbibnob, which was of the sons of the giant, the weight of whose spear weighed three hundred shekels of brass in weight, he being girded with a new sword, thought to have slain David. 1 Chronicles 20 verses 4 to 8 And it came to pass after this, that there arose war at Gezer with the Philistines, at which time Sibachai the Hushathite slew Sippai, that was of the children of the giant, and they were subdued. And there was war again with the Philistines, and Elhanan the son of Jair slew Lami, the brother of Goliath the Gittite, whose spear staff was like a weaver's beam. And yet again there was war at Gath, where was a man of great stature, whose fingers and toes were four and twenty, six on each hand, and six on each foot, and he also was the son of the giant. But when he defied Israel, Jonathan the son of Shermaiah, David's brother, slew him. These were born unto the giant in Gath, and they fell by the hand of David, and by the hand of his servants. This is the last we hear of giants in the Bible and in the land of Israel. Satan takes on a new method of attack just prior to Christ coming on the scene, and that is the devils begin to possess humans as they give themselves over to them.